Do we want to start with the big, big announcement since there's a yeah. big announcement today? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, so we have our Talia, and her name is Tamara Smart. Mm -hmm. And um, what's interesting and a great connection for her is that she's played Lance Riddick's daughter before. And so it's like a, a nice little nod to him that like they casted her and that they had always planned on working together again. It's really sweet. It is really, really sweet. And it's just, it's really funny that everyone was coming up with all of these conspiracies about when they would tell us who Thali was at all of these big panels. And they're like, mm -hmm. let's just tell you on a Monday before Rick Riordan's book comes out. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, why not? And the way that he talked about it, like this morning in the interview, he was like, Disney said we could do it today. And I was like, oh. <laughs> okay <laughs> and like he was just like surprised about how they're like yeah that's fine and he's like oh and especially the guy who interviewed him this morning and he was like oh apparently we're going to say casting news today and his eyes just like bugged out of his head because yeah he's actually a huge percy jackson fan because he was like what <laughs> it was very unexpected i had sent you a um on threads that i saw this morning becky was answering somebody and she saw that just this random thread it was like a three letter sad poem or something like that mm -hmm. say a three letter sad poem she said no casting news <laughs> and then it was just like oh yeah there is casting news today <laughs> yeah yeah and then also a couple of days ago she responded to somebody on threads that said something like oh if you if percy mm -hmm. jackson or if disney wants to help promote rick's new book they should you know announce some casting something for season two to get attention again and yeah. she just responded to that with like one of those like happy emojis and i was just like i see you doing that <laughs> like i'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind in case something actually does happen <laughs> and yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they put on um on the blog the news site on rick riordan's <laughs> new site that um he's gonna be talking about how she was chosen like during the book tour so it is a nice little way for him to promote the books as well yeah and just from that i would assume that they're on episode three and that mm -hmm. thalia is going to be in flashback scenes in that yeah. episode which makes sense um because the other like thing that happened this week was people saw them filming a scene that was um it was very obviously the scene with with after the hydra stuff when Calarice mm -hmm. shows up and one thing I thought was really funny is that sometimes as fans, we like overthink things like way too much. Like that's actually most of the time what we do because we were trying to figure out there was like smoke and fog and stuff all over the water. And mm -hmm. we were like, what is that? Is that like Luke's ship? Is that them like blowing up like um, when her ship blows up or something? I'm like, I don't think it was any of that. I think that it was just them using fog as a special effect because mm -hmm. the place where they're at when they get attacked by the Hydra is supposed to be out in like a murky swamp. That's why I was like, I feel like that's what the scene is supposed to be, but the location like doesn't fit where that scene is supposed to happen because they're supposed to be in like South Carolina or something. And mm -hmm. then when we saw the scene with like the fog stuff, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's them just trying to make it look like where it's actually supposed to be. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Birmingham wasn't running smoothly even before all of no, that happened, so no. it didn't have to be a, an explosion necessarily. I think no. I saw that in the comments somewhere. Yeah. yeah, and like the it was cute. It was nice seeing like the scene because it was how you would imagine it, like Tyson looking scared about mm -hmm. them coming up to them, and they don't look like uh you know civil war soldiers and i was like thank god for that because <laughs> they don't yeah. need that they look like you know still like magical things somehow on the sea or whatever but it was it was the thing that i liked the most about seeing that part was seeing percy be like uh being like big brother percy mm -hmm. even though tyson's older than him, whatever like they when they the scene starts they're like sleeping on the it looks like they're sleeping at least on the beach together where and annabeth is like sleeping somewhere else <laughs> um yeah. she comes like runs up to them when the creepy things start showing up but it's very the one thing you can get from the scene is that that tyson is scared and that percy is 
talking to him while also trying to deal with like the things that are right next to them suddenly to calm mm-hmm. him down and also like handle it and i was just like it's so cute to see him being able to be a big a big brother like that it is um, yeah but yeah that's the thalia stuff was really fun to finally get the announcement the actress is british mm-hmm. um she was one of one of the people who messages me sometimes is british and she said that she was in a tv show over there that was like a like a magical school like girls only magical school kind of fun show it's called like worst witch Mm -hmm. and it's what people over there know her best for but they really liked her from that show um and so either way there's no way that they would have cast this person as thalia if she didn't do a great job um the one thing i can add on is that today on threads i think yeah becky was responding to somebody else talking about the picture that Dior put up of them doing their table read for episode mm-hmm. three and where she's there. And um, Becky said something about how hearing Luke say like his lines in that, in like their table read made her emotional. And I'm like, yeah, that I, that has to be flashback scenes. Cause I didn't really consider it, but they could do flashback scenes of when Luke and Thalia met and just have Percy or, Annabeth or something be dreaming about it yeah Um, because they have time to go into that stuff now yeah and Percy has one Talia dream like I don't remember when exactly it happens but he sees her he knows it's her even though he's never met her and she calls him seaweed brain so um like yeah yeah. that happens like more later on like that's he has like that like creepy dream where they wake up when he sees like a sarcophagus that's like right Mm-hmm. when the siren stuff happens after that yeah but the, but it's it just makes sense especially around like the hydra stuff that's when annabeth and him first talk about why she hates tyson mm-hmm. and so it just makes sense that they would show that stuff anyway and show you know what what they were like when they were younger and why and why you know annabeth and stuff still like tries to hold on to luke being good one day and things like that um the thing the thing i wanted to just bring up is that this it's it's a good thing this show makes every other production look like a fucking bitch when it comes to diversity it is like sickening how much they do it and how little everyone else does like i was just thinking about like every other show i've ever watched or every other movie or anything that i've ever been interested in there's usually like one black person and especially there's usually one black girl like Mm -hmm. usually people of color that are women are like the last people that are added into things they're always like the last people that get to be directors or writers or be cast in things like this and so like i was just thinking about like there's three of them in one show every female lead is black (laughs) like on this show and i'm just when i think about every other thing that's out there i'm like i know you're a bunch of lying little bitches because if this this is a children's like show it's Mm -hmm. meant for kids if this show can do this on disney like disney is okay in all of these decisions they have changed the race of every character except for walker except for like walker percy he's the only one and yeah, he's literally and really the only not. white person <laughs> and he's fine like that's just how it is and it's and it's just so like great that they can do that and so but it's like if they can do this here there's no excuse for anybody else and it it just made me think about the news that the avatar the last airbender show did this week where the, it was just a wild juxtaposition of one production that actually cares about what they're making and another one that i don't know what the hell is going on with the avatar one if they i yeah. i believe that they care but i also don't know if it's being rushed by the network or just being or not caring as much or something but either way mm-hmm. they put out a open casting call <laughs> in june the middle of june when they're going to be filming in two months to mm-hmm. find Toph, and it's like the open casting call for Percy and Annabeth and Grover lasted for an entire year. 
like every of the all the trio kids did not hear back from them for nine months they all thought that they didn't get the part they didn't think they thought that they didn't get a call back because it'd been so long since they heard from them because they actually took the time to find the right people mm -hmm. and so to do a casting call that only lasts two months before yeah. you start filming i'm like you you know two months is not long enough to even find an actress and then like negotiate a contract and then sign it really in that little amount of time before you start filming and a character there's no way that netflix would have a start date of filming when they didn't know who was gonna play toff yeah. in season two the most important character in all of season two i'm like you guys just put out that casting call to make it look like you tried to find somebody who was disabled yeah and then when and then to be like oh we just couldn't find anyone who fit the right part <laughs> it's like no you didn't you didn't even try and like I, nothing against like the girl that they cast like she there's she has no part in any of this stuff but it's just showing like that is usually what what like hollywood stuff does is things like that and so when this show casts every major female character is black and they've changed the race of almost every single character where it's just totally normal at this point i'm generally surprised that daniel was white <laughs> when he was yeah. announced as tyson <laughs> like and it's and it's great that's how it should be um it's just it's just one of those things that I'm like, this is like the poll that I have to like judge every production going forward. Because mm -hmm. if they could do it with this one, they can do it with everything. So what's your excuse exactly? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, like a lot of I've seen mixed with Toph. And I we had talked about this because I we're in Percy Jackson production, like you and I mm -hmm. are constantly looking at the kids' Instagrams to see if <laughs> like there's any new news. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at Rick Riordan stuff. We're looking at Disney Plus's stuff. And I was like, okay, what happens if I look up Avatar right now? What happens if I go onto Netflix's channels? There's like nothing out there and they've been greenlit for season two and season three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> Percy Jackson, we know that this next upcoming season is like people's least favorite book to be honest mm -hmm. it's you know it's mine because of the lore behind it but like it's it's not people's favorite it introduces some great storylines some great cast members but other than that it's gonna be a hard one to get through but like i still i have faith that it's gonna it's gonna do well because the people care a lot more yeah well that's the thing like everybody <laughs> literally almost every day when the <laughs> account on twitter that everybody follows that updates on new stuff and things like that whenever they post anything about sea of monsters filming there is always somebody in the replies that's like can they just say that they're going to do season three because i need titan's curse in my life and if they don't do it i'm going to die and so like people like i like sea of monsters and people like it and we're excited to see it and there are certain scenes that people are excited for but like the level of like love that people have for every other book after that is like kind of absolutely obscene <laughs> but mm -hmm. still considering that people are really excited and we're talking about it constantly and still want to see anything we can from it and so it is kind of weird that um at the avatar show started filming like two weeks after percy did mm -hmm. and you've heard like nothing about it at all but before before they put out this this thing um and it's just because they 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 did a lot of weird stuff in season one mm -hmm. and so it'd be like if we watched well we already did this but like if percy was more like the character of him in the movies instead mm -hmm. of like we have in in the show where he's actually himself then you know, nobody would be as excited to watch Sea of Monsters and it would be kind of the same situation where there would be people watching it, but it would be like more nervous about it and just not paying as much attention because it makes you anxious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, but that, and that's, I think, where Avatar is. And it really sucks because that is such a really good show. And mm -hmm. a show like this shows that it's po very possible to adapt something into a TV show and do a really good job but i don't think that the people making it or the network especially the network like netflix is willing to take the time to like actually figure that out 
and because it did take time like like rick riordan put out a video saying that he was going to adapt like percy jackson into a tv show in like 2020 i think i think it was somewhere in 20, 2020 when he said it was like official that they were going to do it but they were working on it like behind the scenes like fig figuring out like scripts and things like that for like at least a year before they even started like casting and putting out casting calls for the kids and stuff yeah. and they put out those casting calls somewhere in 2021 and so they did like a lot of work between him and the two main showrunners did work for a long time like building up trust with each other before they ever even got to the point of bringing anybody in and i'm not sure that a lot of other book to like tv show adaptions have like actually done things like that and taken the time to make it good yeah yeah it sucks for well i mean it sucks for avatar i, I know that yeah. the season's gonna be good and yeah um let's see so the other casting calls we would still be waiting on then would be Allison, the character that they announced, and there's somebody else who we're still waiting on, right? Selena and Charlie, maybe? Maybe. Um, like, there were people wondering if they would be announced this year for, like, what it's worth, like, what's her name, Dan Danielle Jalade, who is mm -hmm. friends with a lot of them. She's mutuals with Dan Schatz, who is one of the main showrunners and also created the show with Rick Riordan. And mm -hmm. so, like, the fact that they're mutuals on Instagram, I'm like, and Dior is, she's the one that Dior was like, I can't wait till you come up here in October. <laughs> yeah. So I feel like she might be Allison or something like that. That's my general guess for if she is somebody who she would be at this point. Um, so there is a, a possibility that they'll announce something like that in the next, like, you know, week to few weeks to like month or something, um, mm -hmm. when it comes to her, because, and they're all the thing, like a little bit farther down the road is they are have doing something for the D23 convention in Brazil, like the mm -hmm. first week of November. Like, the yeah. cast likely won't go because they'll be filming, but they did say that they're going to have something there for people, whatever it would be. And so, like, a, a new, probably a new trailer with more scenes than the little bit we got so far. So there is, because that would be happening eventually, the likely, you know, if there are more people, they would announce it then. But it they are very much going with what they did in season one where they just kind of announce people that are cast as they get to the episodes where they're in it yeah and so they announced thalia because they're filming episode three right now that has flashbacks with her mm -hmm. and so whatever whatever like the characters of like allison or if selena and charlie show up during this season whenever they would show up in that way they'll announce them then and like we also are waiting for like Polythemus mm -hmm. to see who will play him because that's probably going to be somebody very interesting. Yeah, who could play somebody like that. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, we never really talk about the monsters mm -hmm. as much when we do this. Cersei's an interesting one too. Oh yeah, her too. <laughs> yeah, it'll be. They're not going to go white with Cersei. I'm sure they're not after all of this. I I can't see it. It's like hard for me to believe that they'll go white with anybody. <laughs> yeah. It's like I honestly think the only reason they did with Tyson is because because Walker's white, and so they just had him look similar enough to him, in the same mm -hmm. way that like Lance Reddick is black, and so Thalia is black, which means also that Jason is also black. By the way, just in case anyone was forgetting about Jason, that's yeah. really fun. <laughs> that's like very many many way far away in the future, but it's still fun to think about. Um, but yeah, I think that that's probably the only reason why they did that, it, just so they would look like similar-ish enough in that way for a TV show. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I can't see, it would be surprising if Cersei was, um, especially because she comments on Annabeth's hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be really bad. <laughs> like, yeah. Unless they want to make her look really bad, then have it be like a Karen white woman with blonde hair. 
Um, but other than that, it should be, you know, probably somebody else. <laughs> yeah, probably. And it would be more fun if it is. Like, I just like them pissing off all of the very uppity classics people mm -hmm. that try to fall back on elitism and be like, it's not right. All the gods are supposed to be with white people only because mm -hmm. I, there's no reason. <laughs> but, that, yeah. but like, they get, they always get so bothered by that and they don't want to admit that it's just you know racism <laughs> yeah they don't want to admit that the gods that transmutate into animals to <laughs> mate with people sometimes yeah. or possibly a different race or into other races yeah, sure. like I'm, I'm waiting for somebody who's a racist idiot to say some comment about tamara and to be Ooh. like she's not right for thalia and it's like thalia used to be a treat Yep. And you think that the thing that makes her unbelievable is that she's played by a black actress when she used to be a tree? Yeah. And that's just part of her story that she used to be a tree and is now not. <laughs> like, yeah. get a grip. So, um, something that was really interesting was just, I didn't realize that there actually is a good Percy Jackson subreddit until today when this news mm -hmm. came out, because there, I found one thread where everybody was happy. They were talking about the stuff that she's been in so far mm -hmm. and you know, like how it's such a cool coincidence, the ta the Lance Riddick thing. Um, I also saw someone make the remark, she's 411 and she's already 19 years old. So she's going to fit even, you know, like for future books, you know, have to spoil too much but mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> she's yeah, not that short one. anymore like i saw that too and i was like is she really that short and then i found yeah. something else that said she was five four and i was like oh, oh I that's think, a little bit better yeah. i think that some american person messed up like with the metric system <laughs> probably yeah um but uh, the other subreddit, the bad subreddit, they, yeah. for whatever reason, like seem to be under the assumption that she's no longer going to be alternative styled. Like, and even in the statement that Rick made today, he was putting, you know, like she is a rage against the machine punk. She is. He literally old. said like, she's alt punk. And I was mm -hmm. like, when you told me that I was like, he he literally said in the statement that she's going to be <laughs> so, yeah and my comment was only like racism makes you very stupid that yeah. they read that and then were like she can't be alt because she's black and it's like actually black people invented that like they invented almost everything that's fun about society so mm -hmm. so um yeah she probably will be i severely severely doubt that she will come out of her tree wearing a leather jacket like what happened in the Sea of Monsters movie. <laughs> yeah. And I know that Annabeth is not going to walk around holding a pine tree stick. Oh my for God. All of, uh, for all of season two to think about her because, dear God. <laughs> but either way, she's not going to look as, as ridiculous as Sea of Monsters version of Thalia is. <laughs> yeah, I mean... And even going back to the original character artwork and stuff, I get what the vision was, but I'm glad that Rick is not married to, you know, how he originally envisioned them because his experience is only one experience. And he's now met thousands and thousands of kids who enjoy these books and has seen the many different faces of people who like who identify with these characters. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah, and just just remember for people who want to say something mean to this actress that thankfully is older than Leah, but is still young. She's only nineteen. That if you are mean to any of the actors on this show because of racist ideas, Rick Riordan will write another angry blog at you, yep. where he explains like what racism is. Like somebody reminded me of this today that one of the best parts of that blog mm -hmm. is that he was like, "I'm the one who cast her." be mad at me harass me leave her alone like i'm the one who decided to cast her she had no like responsibility in any of this and it's like don't make him do that again please like just actually learn something from what you did to leah you know two years ago and even if you want to be a racist pig do it somewhere where nobody has to see it exactly yeah <laughs> yeah i hope we're over that i hate it on like on one of the bad subreddit <laughs> discussions about Leah, 
when I had pointed out that Rick said himself, I casted her, she's my headcanon for her, all of these things, they were like, well, just because he's the author of it doesn't mean he gets to say, yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> the only person who we play that game with is JKR. Yeah. Like, he is actively still coming out with books. Like, his Wrath of the Triple Goddess book comes out literally tomorrow. Ooh. And there are no descriptions of any characters at all. Not even just Annabeth. I didn't know this until the other day. But he doesn't describe any of them because none of them match the original descriptions anymore. Ooh. Like, Percy and Grover don't either. And so, like, they people are going to watch this TV show. Like, kids are going to watch this TV show. And then they're going to get into the books and read them. And so the kids are going to be confused when they read descriptions that don't match the characters that they see on screen. And so he's taking them out. And so yeah. it's like, if he is the he is the author, and he is saying that in his head he pictures these actors as the characters. You, there's nowhere higher you can go than Rick Riordan himself saying this and saying he's the one who literally like was the one who chose who had to say like yes and say yes I pick Annabeth. I pick her to be Annabeth. There is, you can be mad about that, I suppose, but you can't do anything to make that not true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the show news that we have, but mm -hmm. kind of bringing us into, um, into our discussion for today of actually Titan's curse is that now I think people are fully just like, yeah, we're going to see our, our children of the big three go head to head and they're posting pictures of Walker alongside of her. And like, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be so interesting to see them actually like, and of course, we're not going to get to see it immediately in the season, maybe that one dream sequence, but yeah. that's, that's really the only time where they challenge each other. We actually get a lot of them challenging each other where we're at currently in the books, though. Yep. It's going to be like a little like tease of what that will be like. And then we'll spend all of our time between season two and three discussing what that will be like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So to get us into our, our chapters for today, we started with chapter 11, which is Grover gets a Lamborghini. And so where we left off was they had just defeated the Nemean lion. They agreed for Percy to be on the quest. And um, so some things that I kind of thought were interesting was that Zoe says that she's pretty sure that the reason they have military helicopters following them is mercenaries. And Percy asks like, okay, if they're mortal mercenaries, what do they think that, they, like, who do they think they're working for? What do they mm -hmm. see? And she's like, you know, some mortals are worse than, or can be more horrible than monsters. And they honestly don't care. They're just in it for the money. And that's, I think, the first time that Rick shares the sentiments in the books is, mm -hmm. um, like, outright anyway. We see it with Gabe. We see it with, like, some of Percy's bullies early on. But it's interesting that this is the first time they actually say that sentiment. I liked that for, like, him bringing in a bit of his personal politics mm -hmm. because I the friends that I had that lived in Washington, D.C., someone that they were kind of friends with but ended up stopped being friends with was somebody whose job was working for a, a defense contractor. Mm -hmm. And, like, somebody who does that job, you, your job is literally making money off of selling bombs to the government so they can bomb the Middle East. Yeah. And so that, per like, it was a very weird thing. I knew them because of Star Wars, and the person who worked for the defense contractor loved the Empire. And so it was a really weird thing to like realize that and be like, what's going on here? This is really strange. But I will say because of that, that they would talk about, you know, people who do that, like mercenaries, and they are the most disgusting human beings on the planet. People who just take lots of money to bomb other countries and destroy people's lives, and they don't care what they're doing. Um, like Tony Stark in Marvel, that's what Tony did. Um, until he realized that bombs do, in fact, kill people. He needed to be taught that because he's an idiot. But, but I like him bringing in that little bit of, like, his real-life politics because those people are the most disgusting, like, 
some of the most disgusting human beings on the planet and i want him to teach kids that no like get away from people like that please don't join the military don't take money from people to blow people up that you don't even know yeah exactly uh, so since they have these um copters following them um i thought this was interesting talia closes her eyes and she's like dad can you like help me out just a little bit like one lightning bolt please and it doesn't work and you know we've seen that happen to percy we i can't remember if it was just in the show because the show was so in my head um mm -hmm. it happens to annabeth when they go into the arch and um so you know it even happens to our little golden child here of like yeah sorry you're on your own kiddo yep and that does happen with annabeth in the books like yeah. uh athena doesn't help them in the books either and in sea of monsters that entire book is percy being like why won't my dad talk to me and tell me why he he like gave me a brother that immediately makes me bullied and ostracized by everybody that i know um mm -hmm. like to the point that he doesn't even want to talk to him at the beginning of this book because mm -hmm. of that experience so i was kind of like laughing in my head when that happened because i'm like he's not he's not he's not gonna help you <laughs> and like i i did a, a post the other day uh, about i always have like questions that i think when we do our podcast stuff and the thing i i just asked was like the whole thing we talked about that their original plan was to take percy mm -hmm. and so their original plan must have been that they wanted to try to get poseidon to be stuck underneath holding up the sky which would have made everything very different um but i asked basically like do you think that he would have actually done that and like my answer is no like i don't think that he would have done that i think he would have done that if it made it look if he made him look like a shitty you know god i or dad or whatever that he would have done it to make himself look better but i don't think he would have done it to like save percy or anything like that yeah and i mean what we can say positively about artemis at least is that she actually is involved with the mortals who like who are her people you know like she's actually there for the people that she protects to the point where annabeth hadn't even joined yet annabeth is just that age group that artemis loves and artemis still jumps in on her behalf so mm -hmm. At least at least she's a little bit better compared to poseidon here yeah compared to the big three gods they're just they're not there yeah and it's also i mean it almost worked out better than what their original plan would have been because she was so instrumental to the meetings that they were about to have mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> interesting how luke managed to stumble into a good idea <laughs> well you know yeah um so as they're trying to get away bianca's like let's go to the subway i noticed the subway because it wasn't here last time i was in dc and like zoe's the first one to pick up on it she's like or no wait, no grover is sorry grover yeah. is like what the station looked really old like how could it be new because she <laughs> thinks it's a new station and then um I think Zoe even notices where she's like, wait, how long ago were you here? But then she doesn't get to finish the thought. So um, timeline wise, I Googled it. The DC subway system was built in 76. So um, if she is a child of the 50s, she would not have seen it before going into the Lotus Casino. She's from even before that. <laughs> yeah. And but yeah, I, I liked those little tidbits of them because I was wondering when I'm reading this book, I'm like, how did they figure this out? Because I honestly don't remember how they mm -hmm. figure out how old they actually are and how long they were actually like why they don't remember anything, why Bianca barely remembers her childhood at all. And I yeah, that should I just liked how all of them, including even Percy's narration, was like, that doesn't seem correct. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, that can't be right. No place can build a subway system in like 12 years like like that. Yeah, well, and this is the first time that Bianca is really even getting noticed in this book. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, 
we had the scene of her joining the hunters and that's about all of the character building we have had for her so far um this chapter in particular starts building up the stakes with her and um so this is the first moment where at least for me this time reading it around that is the moment where i'm like okay this is where i should be questioning who her parent is like um why you know she's so off in timing mm -hmm. and yeah like why that why that godparent hasn't popped in by now to to do something when they're on this that, that she left to go on a quest without them and a dangerous kind of quest like this too without doing something or saying something at all mm -hmm. or even like just she hasn't shown like any powers either yeah and so that she shows a little bit in a little in a little second but it's so yeah. small that it like doesn't really give anything away yeah so um at this point they're just taking the um the subway multiple directions trying to lose the tracks of the helicopters and um let's see we finally get to the end of the line they get to the end of the subway line they see a homeless person and um at this point let's see um he says something about you're never completely without friends and that's when i was like okay that's definitely a god mm -hmm. but what's funny is my notes from the first time i read this i thought it was prometheus and i thought it was prometheus because he um starts talking to them for a second and then um after they turn away it says the trash can in front of us was cold and empty as if he'd taken the flames with us and that mm -hmm. made me think prometheus um but yeah it turns out to be apollo which we find out a little bit later but um let's see on the train that or at this end of the train lot they see a automobile carrier that is headed west and so each of the kids kind of break up and pick different cars to sit in mm -hmm. yeah um and interesting enough um the very first car that Percy decides to sit in is with Talia. Um, and yeah, so this conversation, <sighs> it's interesting. Let's see. So we find out she hotwired the car so that it can play music. Um, so I don't know if that was her using her lightning powers for evil or if she just happened to have that skill because she was on the run as a child. It's probably a little bit of both. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like she's probably lucky enough to be able to do it because of that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay, so then Percy tells her that the monster specifically wants to target her. And she doesn't really seem phased by this. She just says, that's great. I love being used at bait. Um, no idea what the monster might be. She shook her head morosely. But you know where we're going, don't you, San Francisco? And then they get into how San Francisco is the mountain of despair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I still, th I every time they mention like the monster, I just always think it's funny that he found it already. Yeah. Um, but nobody is like talked to him, so they don't even know that, and he doesn't think that what he found is like important, or he doesn't know what they're even necessarily looking for. Um, so they just, they keep talking about this thing as if they haven't, as if it's something else they need to deal with when the entire time I'm like, child, you found it already. It's just that nobody knows that yet because no one has asked you what you did before you left on this quest. Yeah, yeah. And nobody would think to ask him either because they, no. they're constantly underestimating him. Yeah. Um, let's see. So after a little bit, they get into the meat of their conversation this time around which is that percy has finally deduced that the reason she doesn't like zoe is because at one point she was going to become a hunter and um so let's see Talia, i like, her, I like how yeah. he figures that out that it's basically him looking at her and zoe and being like they have very similar personalities Mm -hmm. why do they have similar and just thinking about it for a second it's like oh that's why you don't like her because she saw that you're similar to her and tried to get you to join her club 
Yeah. Like, why else would you have this disdain for them, like, in this way, other than that? Yeah, and so Talia says the reason she didn't, and she's, like, gripping the steering wheel as she's saying this, is I would have had to leave Luke. Um, and <laughs> when the, the conversation devolves into Luke, I, this is a side I feel like we haven't seen of her yet, because she hasn't really acknowledged her connection to Luke in that way. Like, really, this is the first time she's doing it where she's saying, I didn't become a hunter because of him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there was a little, like, bit of that where when Percy said that Luke was there, she looked upset and didn't want to, and wanted to get away from him because she didn't want to mm -hmm. deal with it. Um. This, this conversation is just so many things all at the same time. This is the one that made me really upset when it ended, where I was like, I need to genuinely ask you what she means, because I know what I, I know. think she means, but I might not be accurate because I am seeing everything through like a severe trauma lens. Uh, and so that might that sometimes that's not I ask people stuff like that sometimes because it's sometimes not accurate. But um. One thing that comes up with Percy is that people, because Athena says that his his fatal flaw is that he cares about people too much, basically, like that he would sacrifice everything for somebody in his life. And she says that in like a negative way. Mm -hmm. And that's not his fatal flaw. That is Thalia's fatal flaw. Yeah. And this conversation depicts that very, very well, because can you imagine somebody saying out loud, like, Luke would never hurt me? Yeah, when, yeah. When well, the exact word she says is, um, you know, hard to admit Zoe was right is what Percy says to her. Yeah. And she says, she wasn't right. Luke never let me down, never. He literally just poisoned her in the last he, book. He tried to kill you. Yeah. The only reason that you are alive right now is because he tried to kill you and everyone else at camp that you care about through like a miracle you are alive because percy pulled a like a miracle straight out of his ass to like make that happen but mm -hmm. he tried to kill you when you were stuck as like a sentient being and couldn't fight back and she's still sitting there being like luke would never hurt me luke would never did this stuff and it's um <laughs> there's like a whole like scapegoat thing that i want to say at, at a certain point in this chapter because it just became like overwhelming for me the little things that come up that are only things that i honestly think you would notice if mm -hmm. you are one yourself um because i just know what we do but it is just these things keep happening in this book where people say things to percy's face that is the most like heartless shit that you can say to him like the to imagine saying something like that to him there's no way by this point that she doesn't know that Luke has tried to kill him four times by yeah. this point. And Luke just tried to kill him again. And they got away from him, but he tried it again and he just didn't work. And so like the idea that she is sitting there telling him to his face, like, no, he's never, he's never done anything to me before. Uh, Zoe wasn't right about him. Like, I can get that you don't want to admit that about somebody, you don't want to admit that you're wrong, mm -hmm. but you're telling, a, like, somebody, like, your age to their face, basically, that all the times that he tried to kill him doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you're still defending him to his biggest victim. Like, people do this to scapegoats a lot, and we just sit there and take it, because it's like, what else are we supposed to do when we try to defend ourselves? people get mad at us and say that we're the ones that are being mean. And so all he he does, honestly, the best thing you can do in this sort of interaction, which is just leave. Because yeah. it's one of those things of, I know that she's never going to admit that she sounds like a ridiculous person right now. I know that I'm right. And she even knows that I'm right about this. She just doesn't want to admit it. And it's like, this conversation is only gonna get worse. The longer it goes on, the best thing I can do is just leave her alone. And that's literally all basically what Percy does with with Thalia this entire book. Like, I think it is so fascinating that people look at Percy and Thalia as if it's like a rivalry or that they're both 
like i saw even things today about oh i can't wait to see them like fight each other and it's like when has that actually happened yet it hasn't actually happened yet like she yells at him and he just tries to stop it like mm-hmm. he she yells at him he gets mad for a couple seconds one time but so far but other than that he's basically just trying to leave her alone he's trying yeah. to give her space he's trying to make things like okay he's trying to get along with her and she's making it very difficult and so the thing i wanted to say about the end of this conversation is when she says like um think about why annabeth wanted to join the hunters like Uh my interpretation of that i was like is she blaming him for that like is she saying that it's his fault that he, he she wanted to join the hunters because why else would you tell him that and i'm genuinely asking you why else would she say that because what else does she mean like i know that this is my trauma stuff but i just assume that everything is my fault and it, she blames everything else on him in this book so far and so i'm like is she actually saying that to him or is there something else she could be talking about yeah my interpretation of what she's trying to do there um yeah she says annabeth wanted to join the hunters too maybe you should think about that um literally the only explanation we've had in the book for her possibly wanting to join them is that her dad is moving and she like that's her stability and so my interpretation more is like annabeth wouldn't choose you as a reason to stay like i did for luke um like it was supposed to be hurtful in that way either way it's her being very mean to him yeah to be, like the best case scenario is what you said where she's saying like annabeth wanted to join the hunters because she doesn't because you're not important enough to her to mm-hmm. like stay here. And so think about how she's so important to you that you're willing to do all these things to save her, but you're not but you're not that important to her and that that somehow means that he's somehow done he's lacking in some way. And I say all of this because he absolutely thinks that it's his fault. Mm-hmm. Like 100% he thinks it's his fault in this book that Annabeth wanted to join the hunters. That's why he's panicking at the end of this book when he's trying to say something to her and he can't get words out because he's panicking so much to stop her, to try to stop her from joining when he thinks that she's still going to join because he thinks that it's because of him and he needs to say something to stop her. Yeah. And that is just, that's so mean. Uh, mean doesn't sound like the correct word. It's not. For that, it's like, heart wrenching it's like you stop taking somebody's heart out of their chest and stomping on it when they're at like their absolute lowest point it's beyond cruel to say to somebody like you're not important to them you're not important enough to them like luke is important still to me like luke is a murderer he Mm -hmm. tried to murder me and he is still more important to me than you when you have a best friend it's like why would you ever say that to somebody even if you thought that that was true why would you feel the need to put a a kid that's going through everything that he is in this book in like put that in his mind that like even when he's trying his absolute hardest he's still not good enough to the people that he cares the most he already feels like that anyway but like why would you why would you ever say that to somebody besides knowing that that they are right about what you what he just said about luke and you want to make them feel just really bad yeah like that's the only way i can explain that because like with my situation with my golden child sister um even up until yesterday (laughs) there is a lot of times when she says things to me and now i'm aware of it because i've done enough therapy to understand our dynamic after six fucking years um it took a long time of during those years to even understand it but i understand it enough to know and recognize when she's saying something to me because she wants to hurt me Mm -hmm. and like when my sister says that stuff to me she almost seems like she's like happy about it like when she says stuff like that to me she's almost like smiling when she says it to me still she did it yesterday 
and she still says that kind of stuff to me and hurts me like that and i can i can know even now i can know that she's saying that to hurt my feelings and and i can know that but it still doesn't mean that it doesn't still hurt me a lot because it yeah. does and so like it's a whole that's the only explanation i have for that and that is just so awful <laughs> Yeah. Especially when he hasn't actually done anything. All he did was remind you that Luke is a murderer. Like, because he tried to kill him. It's just... It's just so, so cruel. And it's like, honestly hurts my brain that people think that this is a rivalry. Like, he yeah. has never been that unnecessarily cruel to anyone ever. There are times when he should be <laughs> to people yeah. that are absolutely horrific to him. And he's not like that ever. And I just, he would never say something like that to her in that way to purposely hurt her and, or anyone else, but especially her. He wouldn't, he doesn't do that. He instead gets out of the car and walks away. Like when she yells at him, he tries to walk away and leave her alone. Mm -hmm. It's just so it's so accurate to when you're the scapegoated person um how people try to like that's how people try to like put you down into your place but it's yeah. just so painful like when i read that i just like i had to stop reading because i was dissociating so much that i couldn't even read the book <laughs> like the words were just like moving all the way across the screen where they were like on the wall next to me because yeah. I was dissociating so much from that. And I was like, I need to like calm down because it that, that is something that actually happens. And it's like, it happens in a way where it actually occurs. And so it doesn't feel like this like big moment in the book because Rick isn't like an over dramatic, like after school special writing person about trauma. He writes it about in a way of like how it actually happens in real life. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things that I feel like goes over people's heads if you don't realize what it is, but this is why we're here <laughs> to try to explain just yeah. how, just how horrible that is and that he just walks away from that and just moves on like nothing happened. Yeah, yeah, he's not one to like challenge her on that because his self-esteem is it's in hell you know yeah. and um he probably was already feeling like oh man annabeth is gonna leave me what did i do and i just want to get her back and fix all of this so whatever was gonna happen can happen um because at this point i'm sure he'd even take her becoming a hunter to her being dead you know mm -hmm. um and so yeah for her to pile on and be like she was doing all of that because she wanted to get away from you or because she doesn't care enough about you to stay as she is just especially considering that she was at school with annabeth the last couple months when percy wasn't there and so it's even more of like a dagger in that situation because she was around her and talking to her a lot more than he is and she knows that like she knows mm -hmm. that she was around annabeth a lot more it feels like that thing that girls do in middle school and high school, especially where they say things like that to you because they're honestly, most of the time it's because they're like jealous and insecure that mm -hmm. you have a friendship with somebody and that friend actually likes you more. And so the way that they try to push you away is to say horrible stuff like that to you so that you just stop going around that person. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's basically what she's doing there. And that's, horrible <laughs> like it's yeah. horrible especially because of what he's feeling right now like i think it's this next part when he ends up where apollo ends up talking to him mm -hmm. um but like during that part he's thinking about how he doesn't want to sleep yeah because he doesn't want to have a nightmare about his best friend being tortured and so it's like he's he doesn't have any food he barely has any clothes everything is falling apart and he doesn't want to sleep like he doesn't want to sleep he can't eat like what the fuck does he have going for him right now like literally nothing yeah and i don't think that talia sees that because her problem and we've said this before is control 
That's mm -hmm. her like fatal flaw. Hamartia, if we're going with the Aristotle like terminology, um, she needs that control. And in that moment, he took control from her by saying like, you chose the wrong thing, look at you. And um, every every single bit of their give and take so far has been like a vie for control, even if Percy's not doing it like intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, the Nemia Lion, I think she forgave that one in the moment because she had to, she literally had to. But this also could be a little bit of, of like feelings about that too, because it's like, oh, we were all lost and didn't know what we were doing. And then all of a sudden Percy comes in and saves the day. What an asshole. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that whole thing where when you're in the like the lower like scapegoated whatever role, they they always feel the need to like somehow make sure that you know that you're at the bottom and mm -hmm. it's like we are intimately aware of that of every second of our lives that that's our role you don't need to like redo stuff but it's like that sort of a thing where he did he showed up and he saved all of their lives he did that he helped them um but because he did that she he now has to like pay the price for that even though he doesn't understand that's what he's paying for that's mm -hmm. why she was that cruel to him is because it's like well he did a good thing but if he does that again he's gonna start taking like the spotlight away from me so i need to crush him mm -hmm. so that he doesn't do anything like that again and i'm the one who comes up with all the plans that saves everybody while he's just there like he has yeah. no idea that she's thinking like this she has no idea that this is why she doesn't like him really and like is so aggressive towards him she do he doesn't know any of this stuff he just thinks that yeah, I just mess up all the time. And mm -hmm. that's just my fault. If she's mad at me, I must have done something wrong. And that's yeah. it. Because why would he why would he think that there's nothing in his life to give him any indication that he would think otherwise. And so it's just yeah, that really, really sucked. When I read that, I was just like, Oh, my God, like, and it's interesting, because I remember, I uh, that one interview that Walker Scobell did where he talked about Thalia for a while that I really liked, he mm -hmm. mentions that scene. And I did not know what he was talking about because I didn't, rem obviously, I'm never going to remember this scene existing <laughs> when yeah. I'm reading these books. I had to stop myself so I would remember reading it this time. <laughs> and so, but I, in that, in that interview, he mentions, like, they're talking about scenes with Thalia and the, the hosts of the podcast are like, yeah, they're these moments where it seems like they might get along and then like something happens to just like mess it up and he says like he cuts them off and saying like the scene in the car and they're like yes and he's and he like kind of stops and he's like i hope there are a few scenes when we're filming that aren't that bad and it's like <laughs> because he already knows that scene is really bad <laughs> anyone who over identifies with percy knows how bad that scene is and I, like when I was watching that, I was like, I, I was like, I don't think that the host get what he's trying to say. And I didn't even know what this, what scene he meant. But now I know what he was talking about. I'm like, dear God, <laughs> like, yeah. He, like, yeah, like no wonder why he was like, I hope there's some scenes where we can get along and it's not all horrible. <laughs> like, yeah. God. Well, and the thing that like, she's not even understanding it. She doesn't like the spotlight. Like as much as she's vying for the control of it, when she's in it, she fumbles every time. You know, we have Capture the Flag where her plan was a complete flop. And then we have, you know, when she was driving the bus and she didn't want to just admit, I'm afraid of heights. I should not be the person behind the wheel. Mm -hmm. And she ends up scorching a city. Like, um, you know, she has, she has this superiority complex, but at the same time can't step back and say, I kind of hate being in the spotlight. <laughs> That's like the thing about the golden child scapegoat thing that I think is like weirdly fascinating is how mm -hmm. there are things that each person is just like actually good at, but mm -hmm. they're, but like they, f when you don't understand what's going on, you fight against those like natural roles so much and it causes so much of the problem. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm also somebody that can just like be like, okay, we just need to do this, this, and this. Like, this is a problem. Let's solve the problem. Like, I'm not like a type A person at all, but 
I am the kind of person that for like my entire history of my family, when something was going wrong, I was usually the one that would be calm and be like, okay, this is the problem. This is what we can do to figure it out and fix it. So let's go do that. While everybody else was like freaking out or upset or whatever. Like my sister would be the one literally screaming her head off and like not doing anything productive and just like being upset about whatever happened while I would be like coming up with what we can do. And that's basically what's happening with them too, where Percy just naturally, because of his life experiences being the scapegoat, can like think on his feet like that and just think of things to do. And he's not trying to do that. He's not trying to be like a leader. He's not trying to take over. That's just his natural kind of ways that he thinks and the things that he's good at is, is thinking quickly in situations where you need to make quick decisions without thinking too long about them. Mm -hmm. And so he's just naturally good at that stuff. And so he should be in that role, especially yeah. because he doesn't actually want, like, he doesn't care if people know him. He doesn't want Kleos. He doesn't want any of that stuff. He doesn't want people to know his name. He just wants everybody to leave him alone. And so ironically, somebody like that is the person that if you need somebody to be in charge, they are the best person to because they're actually going to make like the decisions that are good for everybody instead of what's good for them personally. Mm -hmm. But it is a thing that, like, the golden child wants that because they want total, like, control yeah. over, like, every dynamic. But then when they have that control, it usually doesn't work the way that they want. And then they just blame everybody else for, for the things going wrong because it's like, it can't possibly be me. Yeah. And it's like, it's fine if you don't want to do this stuff. It's fine if you're not the type to, like, think quickly on your feet like this. You have other qualities that make you, like, a good person to be around and a good person situations like this um mm -hmm. but they just can't like accept that until they get to the point where they can actually see what they're doing and salia especially in this story um in this book at least never never even gets close to figuring figuring stuff like that out yeah <laughs> yeah so as you said percy just leaves the car after that he ha then heads over to the lamborghini that grover's been hanging out in um grover's asleep he had been playing his pipes trying to impress zoe and bianca but gave up eventually and while he is sitting in that lamborghini apollo appears to him and he knows it's apollo because he says a very awful haiku um let's see uh so what's interesting is that Apollo acknowledges he's breaking the rules here. Mm -hmm. He says, Zeus says, we have to be hands off, but this is my baby sister. So I'm, I'm here right now. I want to give you guys a little bit of help because I want you to find her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing that's fun with like continuity when it comes to that is that many, 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 many books later in the trial, Trials of Apollo books, when Apollo is the one that's in trouble, Artemis mm -hmm. shows up when she's not supposed to to try to help him too. Yeah. So it's just part of it's that whole dynamic they have of like I will make fun of my sibling, but if you make fun of them, I'm gonna stab you. Yeah. <laughs> it's very much there. I like that they it, he gave them that sort of dynamic. <laughs> yeah, it fits for them being twins and them being polar <laughs> opposites at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um. So you know he starts talking to Apollo, starts talking to him about where they're headed on the quest. Do you know where Artemis is? No, that's darkened even him. And um, he tells him to consult Nereus, the old man of the sea, which like is just an older prophetic figure in Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, he's kind of just all over the place in mythology. He doesn't have any particular myths that like I think of when I think of Nereus. Um, so I think they're kind of they're making a distinction between older and newer gods. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. It's so funny, too, how Percy says, but it's your oracle. Um, can't you tell us what the prophecy means? Apollo sighed. You might as well ask an artist to explain his art or a poet to explain his poem. It defeats the purpose. The meaning is only clear through the search. That is not true. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's why I like that Percy's like, okay, so you don't understand how it works either. Got it. Uh, yeah. Because I'm like, yeah, no, I make art. People <laughs> ask me all the time what it means, and I tell them. Yeah, it, it, like it doesn't mean that you can't like 
find your own meaning into the art that I made. But one of the questions most people ask me when they see it is like, oh, what made you want to make that? Or what were you trying to make when you did that? And it's like, yeah, no, that's a normal part of being an artist <laughs> is that people ask you what you were trying, what you were thinking about and you tell them, but it doesn't mean they have to follow it. And I'm like, Apollo, you're bullshitting because you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> Yeah, Apollo's just so cocky, he can't say I don't know. He's like, no, just consult somebody older and smarter. Like, you should be good. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, but yeah, as you said, Percy had said he didn't want to fall asleep. He didn't want to dream because he was scared. The kid has been having nightmares of his grandpa, Kronos, since, like, mm. the first book. Um, now he's having nightmares about Annabeth. So, um Apollo gives him a dream, but the dream he gives him is more of a flashback. And in this flashback, um, they don't outright say it, but he's he's Hercules because he's also still wearing the Nemean lion skin. And he is talking to a very familiar female voice um, that decides that she's going to help him. We don't know in what. Um, we don't know exactly, like, the full scene of what's going on, but we do know she takes out a hairpin that later becomes Riptide. Um, she says that, let's see, uh, they don't outright say her dad is Atlas okay. here. Am I giving away too much by saying that? I, no, it's I'm okay. I think most people who would listen to this have read the books already anyway. Yeah, um, so um, this is where I started looking into it. So they mentioned Ladon, which is a river god, it's an old river god. Um, and then they mentioned my father, which at first I was like, wait, okay, so this person is some sort of nymph. Um, but then when they outright say my mother, Cleone, that's when I was like, okay, there's the Pleiades that had a baby was Pleione and Atlas, or there's the Hyades that were Pleione and Atlas. Um, but Rick Riordan Wiki, and I made sure not to read too much, so I wasn't spoiling it for myself, says so she's <laughs> actually a Hesperity, which, like, that isn't the traditional parentage for them, but it's okay. Rick can, Rick can do that because Zoe is his own invention, mm -hmm. as is this story i'm pretty sure there wasn't like a maiden helper that gave hercules a sword like this um let's see and yeah so percy wakes up kind of realizing that sword is my sword that girl in the dream was actually zoe and um yeah i wonder what that was all about yeah and i will say that the the quest that I guess I'll say that Hercules was doing of trying to get out of that area, that garden area where the dragon is and getting the golden apple. That's the quest that Luke did oh, twice. Wow. That's where that's where that like scar on his face comes from mm -hmm. is from that. And he went on that quest alone because he's a diva. Um, yeah, he wanted like Hermes let him go on a quest by himself instead of three like there usually is and oh Issa's reminding me yes Percy hates Her Hercules he yes. hates Hercules hates him and this book is why he hates him like yeah. because of what he did to Zoe like we don't have the whole story at this point we only have a part of it um but Percy has an unending hatred for Hercules and I I also hate Hercules in this version of the story because you would after you hear like the whole story you definitely are very angry at him and um just hearing this small part you can understand more like which is i like zoe as a character more than the other like even like artemis mm -hmm. and like the, some of the other other hunters because you learn things so you can understand why she feels the way that she did or does yeah. um that like you understand that hercules you know, taking something from her like that, where she's trying to help him, and that obviously somehow backfires, even though you don't know how in this moment, that's clear that it did somehow, because Percy has this sword, like, how the heck does he have it if if it ended up not coming back to her, because the last thing she says to him is to bring it back to her, um, and that obviously never happened, 
but so it's like you know that something happened here and so you can understand why she doesn't trust like percy at all at first because he's a guy who's a hero and mm -hmm. whatever happened with hercules was bad enough for her to not trust any guys at all anymore and considering who her dad is <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i i have i had i have had he's dead i don't know how to talk about him i have a dad like that or had a dad like that he's no longer alive but he's still my dad but mm -hmm. yeah it's very easy when you have a dad like that that's that violent and angry and bad to um to just want to hate like all men or at least be afraid of men by default i was uh it was a weird mix because i was friends with a lot of guys when i was in like high school and stuff but mm -hmm. i also was and still am <laughs> like afraid of a lot of guys like when i'm walking when i take like a walk around like sunset or whatever if there's like a guy on the street i will like leave i will like cross mm -hmm. the street and walk completely out of the way that i'm going to because there's one guy on the street he's not going to do anything to me but i'm going to do that anyway every single time and so like i know that the last i think it was the last episode we did you were asking like why didn't she bring percy like on the quest like what like he's not like you know romantically attracted to any of the other girls or anything like that like so what is this is that's this is why this is why i think she didn't want to bring him at all is because she doesn't trust men at all and like she knows that she's known this entire time that her dad is the one doing this stuff there's no way that she doesn't know that her dad is the one behind it um like she knows who the general is she knows who was shooting at them when they were at the manor getting nico and bianca she knows that she's gonna see him mm -hmm. and so it's like yeah i understand why considering that why she wouldn't want like to bring another boy on a quest with her when she already knows that she's going to have to deal with that. <laughs> yeah. Wanting to, like, deal with that in the best way she possibly can. The only thing still I can come up with of why she brought Bianca is that I feel like she brought her to almost, like, try to train her mm -hmm. how to be, like, another leader in case something happens to her or something because, because of her knowing from the start that she's probably going to have to fight her dad. Um, and that's the, that's the thing, that's the only thing I can come up with. And that makes sense to me that she would, especially if she somehow knew who Bianca's like parent is. And so if she had any knowledge of how powerful she was, I could see her bringing her along just so she could like try to train her as best she possibly could in okay. case something does happen. Um, that's the only thing I can never come up with, but yeah. That's that's why I like I still like Zoe a lot. Um, because I understand. <laughs> yeah. When your dad's but... a monster, sometimes you're afraid of everybody that reminds you of them. It's well, just yeah. how it is. And and every here I mean, Dionysus said it earlier. She's a maiden helper. She's one that betrayed her own family and or at least we get that impression from him. He didn't outright say that. And they, they see it like girl. They see it like she did. She's, you know, another scapegoat. Like, she didn't betray them. Like, they're ridiculous people. <laughs> and so she's not the one that did that. Um, they're just horrible. But they would see it that way. But it still shows that she was somebody who, would, who was willing to try to help somebody at some point. Mm -hmm. And kind of put herself out there. And it greatly affected her life after that and so it makes sense why she would want to join the hunters so that something like that couldn't i mean if i had a dad like that i do i do have a dad like that if like if i if somebody came up to me when i was younger and told me that they could make me immortal i would be like right now so that my dad doesn't kill me and yeah. i would do that and so i'm like yeah she's the one that it makes complete sense why she would have wanted to join them and why she's like so hardcore for Artemis because you wouldn't want to like question that decision. Yeah. Um, let's see. So getting into chapter 12 now, 
Um, they arrive in New Mexico after being on this automobile carrier and they end up in a city called Cloudcroft where there's absolutely nothing. They find out that even if they were to try to get a taxi, the taxi itself would have to spend hundreds of dollars worth of fare just to get to them at mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at spending a ton of money if they want to do anything. And they don't have any of that. <laughs> no, yeah, because they ditched their bus and they are running from mercenaries. They know they have these like dragon teeth soldiers coming after them too. Um, so they kind of like split up a little bit and they're like, okay, let's, you know, get some food, let's get coffee and then we'll figure out what we're doing. You know, like talk to some people, let's try to figure out a way out of here. Mm -hmm. And that's what gets us to actually Percy and Bianca having a conversation for the first time. Yeah, he saved this girl's life. He's watched her literally give it away. And this is the first time he's actually getting to sit and talk with her. Mm -hmm. And it, this was like the conversation where after it, I was just like, I was like picturing in my head the things that I wanted to say when we did this, because I was just like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> like, oh, oh my God. Um, yeah. It was like right away from the beginning of the conversation, it's like, oh, I don't think Thalia wants to be around me very much. So I'm just going to go talk and be awkward with this child that mm -hmm. I've never actually spoken to. So it's already off on a weird foot. Um, but I took a picture and sent it to one of my other Percy Jackson friends that's read this mm -hmm. book already that recently of the part in when she's talking to Percy and she's saying like, oh, I never would have, I never would have joined the hunters if you didn't, if you weren't such a nice person. And I was like, no, yeah. no, no. Why are you saying that to him? Why are you saying that to him? He is never going to forget that for the rest of his life, that because he was a nice person, you joined the hunters. I was like, fuck. I like sent it to the friend and I was just like, fuck. <laughs> Like yeah, I did not. I, I did not. I did this read. I was like, you, Percy is the last person you want to say that to. But yeah, she's like, I figured if there was more people like you at Camp Half Blood, he'd be just fine without me. Oh my god! <laughs> and it's just, and okay. So the thing about the whole scapegoat stuff that just this conversation was like, I just need to say stuff about this is. The reason why I love this book, even though it's really hard because there is a lot of really hard stuff going on, is that he is, is the things that are happening with him are just like exactly how these things happen when you're in this role. And so like him, when he was a kid, um, like Gabe hits him and tells him not to tell his mom. And then he sees things and people at school think that he's hallucinating. Mm -hmm. and so just those two things alone and then adding on the fact that all these weird things happen when he's in schools that he always gets kicked out of and he thinks that it's not his fault but everyone else thinks it's his fault like yeah. he is very used to people telling him that he should keep how he feels to himself and that it is his job to take care of other people to make other people comfortable and to not actually do anything about himself never show his emotions never tell people when he's upset until those moments where he can't like hold it in anymore and he explodes a little bit for mm -hmm. a little while, but never to the point that it really should. And that's just what he's used to. And this book is so harsh when it comes to that. And because when I, when I read these chapters, I was just like, I cannot handle any more that nobody asks him if he's okay. Like mm -hmm. nobody is talking to him. Nobody, this is like, especially like he has been trying to avoid Thalia as much as he can this entire book to try to make her comfortable, to try to get along with her because he knows that he's supposed to and like he doesn't want to make things worse. And then he's sitting there listening to Bianca tell him that he just, she just wanted to have a chance to not have to be a big sister anymore and not have to worry about taking care of her brother like she has for you know his entire life and he's empathetic towards that like he's that's the thing that kills me is like he's empathetic towards why thalia will be upset and so he tries to leave her alone he's yeah. empathetic about 
about why why Bianca would want that break. Like he remember he thinks about Tyson, and he's like, oh yeah, I remember when I was taking care of Tyson last year, and I can understand that feeling. Percy had seven thousand chances to abandon Tyson, and he never even thought about it once. He yeah. almost blew himself up in Sea of Monsters because he was trying so hard to protect Tyson. In a, he would never in a million years ever abandon Tyson, even if he was tired of being his big brother, which he's not. But he's still sitting there like you know, trying to empathize with her, trying to make her comfortable, trying to make her not be upset and not be mad at her because he knows it will cause a problem if he tells her how he actually feels about her leaving the hunters. And this entire book, I'm just like, nobody asks him if he's okay. Like, uh -huh. Annabeth is gone. Like, Grover is supposed to be his best friend. And Grover literally forgot to ask him how he feels. Hey, Percy, your best friend was just kidnapped and you're having dreams about her being tortured. Are you okay? Never, never happens. Thalia, hey, Percy, you just saw Luke, the guy who's tried to kill you four times and he just tried to kill you again. Are you all right? No, nobody asked him. Nobody asked him anything. Nobody ever asks him if he's okay. Nobody ever checks in on him. Well, he is constantly checking in on other people and taking care of everybody else. Nobody mm -hmm. acts like he has any feelings. And then people have the audacity to say that he's too angry the very few times when he actually shows that he has feelings. And it's yeah. like, what are you talking about? Like, he had to miss, like, he had to be so depressed, at, even when he's at camp, when they were choosing who's going on the quest he's like i want to go on the quest and then he as soon as he saw that it was going to be a problem because they didn't want him to come he immediately just like gave up and even though he was so depressed that he didn't want to eat he still just like let them do that because he's so used to just making everybody else comfortable even if he's in a lot of pain it doesn't matter he's learned that it doesn't matter when he's in a lot of pain and I'm just reading this book and I'm like, the only time anyone noticed that he was actually really upset and remembered that he has feelings is when Chiron noticed that he didn't eat dinner. Like Chiron yeah. is the only person so far that has actually treated him like a human being. And I know that this happens to us, like to every scapegoat out there, like your friends aren't horrible people, but it is like a crazy experience to like read this from the outside and just remember this stuff that like, we have feelings, mm -hmm. we have emotions, just because we don't share them with other people doesn't mean that they never happen. And it's like, it, it shouldn't take Percy, like, not eating and not sleeping. It should not take you not sleeping anymore and not being able to eat anymore for people to notice that you're upset somebody should ask you about that and like i get upset about this because that's literally what happened to me in like 2019 i just broke down as a person i couldn't i barely slept at all for an entire year there was an entire week that year where i couldn't eat i would drink like a protein shake a day and that was all that i would eat for an entire week mm -hmm. because i couldn't do it and it's like it took that much for people in my life to realize how upset I was. And it's like, I should never have had to do that for people to notice how upset I am. And Ooh. like the most upsetting thing in this entire book is not even happened yet. It's going to happen next week. And, but it's just a thing of like, he is taking so much time taking care of everyone else. And even his closest friends don't ever like check on him. And it's like, what does he have to do to get them to notice that he is a person. Yeah. Like, what does he have to do? Like, Grover is so caught up on going back to searching for Pan that he doesn't, he literally forgets that Annabeth was kidnapped because he's so wrapped up in his own bullshit. And like, I love Grover, but I'm like, you're being a terrible friend Yeah. in this book. Like, how are you not checking on him? Like, he's checking on you and how you feel like, how is that even possible? And it's like, I don't know what to do about this. <laughs> like, this is exactly like how these things go when you are in this role. 
but it's just so horrible to read it happening this way because I just want it to stop. Like, can somebody actually fix this? Like, no, they don't. <laughs> it just continues on like this for like many books after this, but it's just so frustrating. I just want to like jump into this book and just like tell this kid and any other kid alive that like if you're in that role, it is not right. Like it is not your fault. You haven't done anything wrong. It's not that you never showed emotion. You shouldn't have to show emotion for people to know that the things that are upsetting you in your life would would like affect you. Mm -hmm. It just, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do that in order for people to do that. Because if you can figure that out about other people, they can figure that out about you. It is everyone else's problem that they don't treat you like that. Yeah. That's literally all it is, is they, it's easier for a lot of people to just not think about it. And so they just don't think about it. And I don't know how that, how it happens necessarily in that way, but it just does. And it's not right when Percy's going through it in this book. And it's not right when it happens to anybody else either. Yeah. Yeah, and he's going through it, and he's literally just trying to be there for Bianca, who, up until this moment, has been ignored, has been kind of just in the background. Um, we find out yeah. that they had a lawyer coming in to check on them, which I wonder if that was some sort of agent of Hades, or if that was Hades himself being like, oh yeah, I'm lawyer guy. <laughs> um, it feels like a joke to say that an attorney would be like, working with Hades, like the jokes about the underworld and attorneys being evil and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So she says that, um, let's see, our parents, we think they were dead. There was a bank trust for us with a lot of money. Um, Nico and I were out of school. We had to leave it. We got taken to a hotel for a couple of weeks and then <laughs> we got taken to Westover. And in that couple of weeks, GC just happened to build a whole subway system. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, how many couple weeks was that? Exactly. I love, like, it's so fun noticing these little things when you know what happens to be like, oh my god, a couple weeks in that hotel when they were in there for like a couple hours and they missed five days. <laughs> and it's just wild to think about that she doesn't remember anything about her life because she spent like 70 years in a casino playing like games <laughs> yeah well it, it also it makes you like question her experience of looking after nico because uh -huh. she spent 70 years in a fun little hotel that we know is just like a giant arcade for children like you can't tell me you had to babysit him in an arcade where food was provided where you're not going to get sleepy, you know, like what needs are there to advocate for when literally in the Lotus Casino, like that's the point of it. All of your cares are taken care of and you could be there forever and not notice. Yeah, I, I feel very conflicted about Bianca because I'm the oldest sibling and I would mm -hmm. never have abandoned my sister under any circumstances. Like I honestly should have it in some points in my life, but I didn't. Um, but I get so conflicted about it because she is a such a fucking child. Yeah. Like hearing her the way that she talks about like how she decided to join the hunter, she sounds like a kid that's like decided what world in Mario Kart to play. Like she does not under truly understand the like gravity of the decisions that she has been making. She's like, oh, somebody said that I could take a break from having to take care of my brother. And so I just decided to go with it. And I feel cool because now I feel like powerful and things like that. But she still like, she doesn't seem to grasp the concept or like the full gravity of her choices. And that does go into what happens in the next chapter that she doesn't understand like the severity of the things that she has done, like that she will never see Nico ever again I don't think she understands that she will never see him ever again. I think that she thinks that she's almost just going on a fun little vacation and that she can come back sometime and and hang out with him and see him. Like she's like it's horrible that she abandoned him like this. Like but at the same time I'm like you're literally in 6th grade and you don't you obviously don't actually understand the decisions that you're making but you've made them anyway. And so like what are we supposed to do about that? Um, well, it, I don't remember what the exact quote was, but like, 
I'm pretty sure they even promised her they would um that she would get to see Nico still. Yeah. That she would get to visit him whenever she wanted, which like this is kind of a weird thing to compare it to, but there's a whole discussion going on right now with Teen Mom. And it's happening because the two oh, parents yeah. that gave up their daughter for adoption, Carly, are trying to shed some light on the fact that the whole concept of open adoption isn't a legally binding thing. Like, I will say it, follow adoptees on TikTok for the full conversation. I don't even know the whole depths of it, but what I do know is that any sort of open adoption isn't legally enforceable. It's usually just kind of a handshake agreement you have with the adoptive parents. They can pull visits for whatever reason, whenever they want. And so we have Caitlin and Tyler from Teen Mom who as babies, you go back and look at the footage of them signing over adoption papers and stuff, they look like babies. They are and newborn babies in those, I saw some of those videos, they are so young. Like the, the best thing you can know about open adoptions is that when you adopt, when they adopt your child, part mm -hmm. of the legal process is that you give up all of your parental rights. Mm -hmm. And so an open adoption, like the idea that they will see their kid again anytime they want is an obvious lie, like from the start, because mm -hmm. that's not, if you give up all of your parental rights, you don't have a legal right to see them. And so if those adoptive parents decide that they don't want to see you anymore there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it mm -hmm. and so they tell them that because they're in this desperate situation and they're like not they don't understand a lot of the time and mm -hmm. or they're just not thinking clearly and they just do it um thinking that things will be okay that surely they'll let me see my own child when a lot of the time they don't yeah and so it's like this grooming process especially when it's teenage mm -hmm. parents and in a similar way to how Bianca was groomed with this promise, like, oh yeah, you're giving up your responsibility of Nico, but you're still going to be able to check in on him. Everything's going to be great. Not really even acknowledging the fact that you're going to have to watch him get older and die now too. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and like, just actually what that entails, like, I don't I don't think she understands even like what it even means to abandon him like he's 10 and yeah. you just like left him at a camp where he doesn't know anybody you're the only person that he knows and you just left him there with a bunch of strangers like really difficult stuff happens with Nico in the next book and none of that stuff would have happened the same way if she was if she didn't do that and it's just one of those things of she doesn't under she's making these very adult decisions when she is not one and doesn't understand like the domino effects that the that the like decision she's making actually does mm -hmm. and which is why i forever am mad at this version of artemis because she definitely knows that like as a immortal god she knows what's going on and that this kid doesn't actually understand what they're doing and just did it anyway because reasons <laughs> but it's just very hard to hear her talk about that stuff and it's like percy doesn't of course bring it up to her but he has it somewhere in his mind that you know he was forced to say to nico like i'll try to protect your sister and he's holding that responsibility which he shouldn't be um mm -hmm. but she doesn't even realize that he like put him she put him in that very difficult position yeah where his little where her little brother is now holding him responsible for that because she's not there and he's she's sitting there telling him oh you're a really nice person so I dumped all of this shit on you on purpose because I think that you're a nice guy and it's like <sighs> yeah it's like there's empathy of course for the fact that she shouldn't be parentified she shouldn't feel this way and no 12 year old should feel in charge of their sibling that's only two years younger than them like that's a lot that's huge but at the same time this wasn't the way like they're all they they have you know like both of them they're just and i i get that maybe somewhere in her mind she's like okay these these camp half-blood teenagers same age as me but they have far more training so he's so much better off but she's yeah she's forgetting the emotional part of it which is 
they literally don't have family. They've never had family except for each other. Yeah, and it's like one of those things, it's, it is a valid point to bring up that they spent most of their lives having fun in a casino where they never had to worry about money or any of like the stresses that, that a lot of, a lot of, like I was obviously a parentified older sister. My sister is two years younger than me actually. So this is like, not like a abstract mm-hmm. concept to me, but there was like a lot of times when my mom would like leave money for us and I had to go and walk to like a grocery store where she was working or a gas station or whatever and buy food for me and my sister when my parents got divorced and my mom was working four jobs because my dad ruined her money and so like I had to do that stuff because I was the one home I had to do it because I was the one there and like my sister was the younger one who got to just like bounce around with her friends and would get mad at me when I would buy her food that she didn't want and things like that but I definitely was holding a lot of that responsibility or just like being running out of food at home and not having anything to eat when my mom wasn't home yet from work. And, and I used to call her all the time when she was working at the grocery store to ask her to buy things to bring us. She used to call if I didn't to ask if we needed anything before she would come home. And it's just like Bianca and, and was not doing any of that stuff because all of that stuff was provided for them. Even yeah. like the kind of worries about money that Percy had, where he knew that his mom didn't have money to pay for all the schools that he was being forced to be sent to. Mm-hmm. And it's like he had that he had that knowing. He also had to like find money so his stepdad didn't beat him up. Um, and his stepdad probably beat him up anyway, even though he did give him gambling money. And so he had these like responsibilities at a very young age that and she never had this stuff. And yeah. so it's one of those things of like I don't know how normal kids feel because I was not normal. And so I don't know like the responsibility or like the want to like not be around your siblings that normal kids feel when they're the age that she is. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's a situation of like, oh, my younger brother is annoying because I'm now at the age where I want to have my own life and my own friends and my own identity. And he's like my annoying little brother who won't leave me alone. I don't know if it's that sort of a feeling that became like amplified because some magical people showed up and told them that they would fix it for her. Um, Because at least with that, I can understand where that came from, but it is like a very like, this sounds like a weird thing to say in this sort of a book series, but this is, this is like a very privileged thing that she's doing where she is just like, I don't want to have to deal with this. So I'm going to leave. And it's like most of the other kids, in these stories didn't even have like the chance to do that they didn't mm-hmm. have they didn't have everything being taken care of for decades even if they lost like decades of their life they still didn't have that any of that stuff being taken care of like thalia was like homeless for like a year or two or something living in a cave for a while with luke um and so like she definitely didn't have that she just they just ran away from home and Annabeth ran away from home. And as a seven-year-old, yeah. As a seven-year-old, like a lot of them end up running away from home if they don't end up getting found to be brought to camp. And so it's kind of difficult, I think, in this sort of story to have like an abundance of empathy for her because you just, you do, like I do, but at the same time, I look at every other kid in, the, in these stories and I'm like, none of these other kids would have ever, never got like this easy of a road. And it feels really difficult to know that her road was easier than most of them and she still like didn't want to do it yeah that's true um let's see so their conversation ends and um let's see zoe and grover come back with coffee and pastries but then grover starts acting funny and this is the part where i kind of didn't exactly understand what was happening to grover Mm -hmm. like um, i only i will say i only knew that it was pan because i've read the i remember reading the other books and whenever he has like a connection to pan it was like things like this he was doing and so that's the only reason why i knew that it had to be something to do with that because otherwise i would have been like is he high (laughs) yeah (laughs) with the way that he was acting (laughs) yeah he just starts acting weird and it turns out that um 
Yeah, you, as you said, it's panned, but the reason that that starts happening is because skeleton warriors are appearing this time instead of just um, the gray camouflage that they've worn. They're actually blending in with their environment, so they're wearing New, New Mexico State Police uniforms. They have handguns, and um, so they're kind of forced to fight. Um, it's not the entire 12 that Percy saw get planted. It seems to be enough for them to take them on one by one. And um, let's see. So the thing that stuck out, of course, with this, first off, I, I, I had to underline that Percy hits one and then it, it unassembles and reassembles itself. That, that gave me Zelda vibes immediately. Yeah, that's what I thought of too. <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, so the style enemies, anytime you hit them, if you don't get a headshot, this is what happens. They like mm -hmm. uh, crumple up and then they'll reassemble themselves head on last. Um, but we have the hunters actually shooting them in the face and that's not working. So um, that would work in Zelda. It doesn't work here. <laughs> Um, we'll see. Percy also finds out that the Nemean lion coat is coming in clutch because these handguns aren't touching him. Thank God, or else he would have been shot twice in the back. Yeah, um, um, let's see. How far into it was it that Bianca hits it? Because at one point, Bianca hits it, and that was the other moment where I was like, we should be questioning who our parents is for sure uh -huh. right now. That she uses like fire like that and that it works yeah. in in a way where nobody else has done something that works on them and the like child has somehow just and she doesn't even know what she's doing. And yeah, I remember she, Okay, so she whipped out a, a hunting knife and stabbed it in the chest and then it erupted into flames and from the conversation that Percy overheard about these enemies, they were saying no mortal or immortal weapon is going to touch them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, what is that? Who, where, where yeah. did you get that knife from, little girl? <laughs> yeah. Like, what is it? If it's not mortal or immortal, if it's not one of those things, then what the fuck is it? Yeah, so it's some sort of undead knife is, is I think what the implication is. But when they said hunter knife, of course, you're thinking, okay, she just joined the hunters. So maybe it's some sort of knife that Artemis, you know, like has them armed with. But nobody else on the hunters fights like that. They all fight with bows and arrows. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's one of those moments. And then all of a sudden, the Aramanthian boar crashes in. And like, yeah, this part is kind of where it's, it's chaotic for me because Grover is like under some sort of wild pan influence while they're getting shot up. And I was just like, wait, I'm lost now. <laughs> yeah, the, what, there's some line in this part that I liked where Percy is like, oh my God. And, but he, the way that they put it was, or Rick puts it, is like he thinks about Annabeth, he thinks about somebody else that matters to him, so he like gets the resolve to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's why that's not a fatal flaw. <laughs> like, and I just yeah. appreciate Rick putting a little bit like that in this book where at the end of it, Athena tries to say that, and it's like, no, that's a reason to keep going. That's not a flaw in your character that you use the people you care about in your life to get the energy to keep fighting when you're tired and you don't want to anymore. Yeah. And I and, just, yeah. Well, it's, they were never going to beat this boar. Hercules did not beat the Eromanthian boar. He caught it with a net. And so um, I think, yeah, it's interesting how it ends up resolving. So at some point it ends up where Percy and Talia are you know, like faced on the board on their own and they're above a drop off. I'm having trouble picturing this, to be honest. I can't wait for the visuals of the TV show. Yeah. But he says it's a 70 foot drop and Talia's like, I can't, I can't do it. And he ends up just tackling her down and they, once again, Zelda imagery, shields her down this like snowy peak and the boar ends up trapped in the snow. I, you know what, the funny thing about me is that I could picture something like this because even though Wisconsin doesn't have, um, like, 
mountains really we only have a couple of them because of the glaciers and stuff but there are some at least where i could picture what that would look like from like times in the winter when you're yeah. out in like the country by just like woods and stuff there are like huge drop-offs like that when you're driving that you're in the country you're like oh, okay where it's like if you fall down there in the ditch the ditch is going goes down like a long way and you're never gonna get out um but so that's what that reminded me of so i could picture that in my head and i could also picture a giant pig getting stuck in the snow because snow is in like in the mountains especially but when there's a lot of snow it's really heavy and so it's something that like literally like part of the thing in the winter time when it's like heavy there's different sorts of snow but when it's heavy snow it's like so heavy that like you're it's like it like brings your car like hood like down because yeah. it's so heavy and you have to like put in a lot of effort to get it off of your car or to or like if you fall in it when you're sledding and stuff it takes like effort to get out of it and so because I live where I live, I could picture how this could work, but it was still like, it was still funny to me that Percy had to just like, like tackle her and, and then ride Medusa, like, thanks Medusa, down like this mountain. And the main thing I was just thinking when I got down there, I was like, are they going to get out of here? How are they going to get out of here? Yeah. <laughs> because it takes, it usually it takes a lot of effort to get out of here but at least they like stopped the thing and it made Grover stop being so on like wildly unhelpful <laughs> when yeah. he just kept saying the wild the gift from the wild and every, and I and I appreciated how everyone afterwards was like how the heck was that a gift it yeah. just tried to kill us <laughs> Yeah, and he's still like somewhat stammering over oh gift of the wild and he's like mm -hmm. Okay, it's faster than we can ever imagine going any other way. Um, makes me think about SpongeBob. The pioneers used to ride these babies for miles. Um, oh my so, gosh! Uh, he. I also um, like wait the the thing from this that I thought was funny is that I appreciated Percy finally figuring it out that she's afraid of heights. Yeah, because she was never gonna tell him, and it's just I I at least got it that he like finally got it like why are you being so weird all these random times and it's like oh okay and yeah. i just liked him being like you can fly but you're afraid of but you're afraid of heights like i i mean there is a certain point in percy's story where he gets afraid of drowning um mm -hmm. and that is like a visceral sort of fear for him but he he has something that happens to make him afraid of that um yeah. and that's why it becomes like this weird fear for him later on in his life because he does experience it somehow when he thought it would never happen to him it's like the most ironic like phobia you can have to be zeus's daughter and not be able to f ever fly because you're yeah. too afraid of heights to ever even try one of your powers yeah the sky god like okay it is like much later on um when she meets like a sibling of hers that does fly and he does it so like naturally like it's like nothing for him to do it and there's a part where they like he is talking to her and she's like can you really fly have you really flown and he's like yeah like why haven't you <laughs> yeah and it's like, I, that's that I still remember that and just like laughing about that of him being like I don't understand why you wouldn't fly if you had the opportunity to <laughs> but it is like one of those weird things about her it's funny yeah. to me and it 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 it's, it I appreciate it as the scapegoated one that the golden child has has all of these powers but because of a complete a completely and totally irrational fear um, she doesn't even use them all. <laughs> yeah. So what saves them from this situation is Grover finally coming to his senses and bewitching a like apple to just perpetually be in front of the boar's face. Um, sort of like um, it used to be in old cartoons. Like I'm thinking Bugs Bunny era with like a carrot <laughs> on a stick idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, um, and that's kind of where we leave off in this one. Um, just with, you know, Grover acknowledging, oh yeah, that craziness is because I felt Pan. <laughs> All of that was Pan somehow helping us by having a giant pig try to kill us. Got yep. it. <laughs> like, got it. That was Pan being helpful in some way, I guess. Like, I guess, like, the main thing is that those... I, the the skeleton things I think are gone now, um, so there that's at least one thing that's not trying to kill them anymore. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, it was just kind of a weird place to leave off with that one. Let's see. Yeah. So this is it. The next chapter <laughs> we visit the junkyard of the gods. Um, yeah. Take, but mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I don't know. I don't feel like it was a lot of payoff even still, though. Not really. It's because it's because it's just it's because of the next chapter. Yeah, because it's like, how do you you can't really go their final destination being San Francisco from what we can tell so far. So they've made it a majority way of the way across the US already. Mm hmm. They're almost somewhat almost there, at least. Yeah. Yeah, New Mexico is not too bad. I've is New Mexico where the Grand Canyon is? I've been to the Grand Canyon once. The Grand Canyon is in Arizona, but New okay, Mexico yeah, is I'm like bad at this. <laughs> it's like next to Arizona, like it's yeah. New Mexico and then Arizona. Yeah, like my mom had a boyfriend at one point who had family that lived in New Mexico, and I feel like we drove through Arizona to get there. I don't remember. I was like eight when this happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I have been there once, and I've been to Hoover Dam once, but, like, don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. The second um, chapter for next time is, like, something about the dam, and so I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> um, but, yeah, it was just, that whole thing was just very, it was, like, the weirdest fight ever, but it's because it's setting up to what's going to happen next so they just kind of had to cut things off in a strange place but mm -hmm. either way it's going to be really funny imagining those two actors having to fight a giant like pig <laughs> yeah <laughs> we'll see oh how they're that yeah um let's see I'm trying to think of what else we could talk about with these ones. I mean, it feels like maiden helpers are going to be a th theme throughout just because of Zoe's presence and like as we find out more of her lore. And I don't know if the implication there is supposed to be something to do with Annabeth and why she may or may not want to be around Percy moving forward. Um, I mean, I don't know if this is a common thing, but as a quirky, smart girl that happens to date cis males, like there is a fear sometimes that you're going to turn into their manic pixie dream girl. And I almost wonder if, if anything's holding her back from Percy, is it like, you know, I don't want to be just another thing in his story to propel him forward because Annabeth wouldn't be okay with that. Um, like she'd be afraid of that in a different way than I am where it's like okay is this my only good thing about me she'd be like no that's not going to be a thing about me at all <laughs> yeah and like one thing with like when we compare this stuff to like Harry Potter is in those stories Hermione just plays this role where she is the one that solves a lot of Harry's problems or like helps him out when nobody else will and like in the context of that story nobody ever like challenges her having that role she doesn't really ever say anything about how if she doesn't want it or not it's just something that she does but annabeth is like an actual well-rounded character more mm -hmm. than hermione was and so like she wouldn't want to be stuck in like a role like that like she wouldn't want to only have that sort of role in percy's life and like i don't I don't think that she does, but it's also a thing of she's a teenage girl mm -hmm. and she hasn't seen him in like a bunch of months. And so, and the thing that always is the thing with Annabeth and Percy is Luke, where mm -hmm. like 
she wants to hang on to that and like any time that she would see Percy she would be thinking about the stuff that Luke did to Percy and that you know just makes that a lot more difficult and so that is like always a thing with her that I could see why she would almost like want to avoid him because being around him is just going to remind her of that stuff and she doesn't want to think about it she wants yeah. to like forget about that part and just try to focus on believing that Luke could be redeemed somehow or that he's not as bad as as Percy thinks he is or whatever and like especially because of the end of Sea of Monsters when Luke is like here like uh bear twins eat Annabeth like mm -hmm. a year ago I said that she was my sister and I would never turn against her but now I want you to eat her and so I could see her almost like doubling back in that way after experiencing something like that especially not seeing Percy for a few months when they were at different schools mm -hmm. of like wanting to think trying to find something negative in their dynamic to justify like running away from it and joining the hunters instead and like I'm not gonna lie like being around Thalia would be like the worst sort of <laughs> um influence of that because she would just she would she would just go along with that because she wouldn't want Annabeth to like Percy more than her <laughs> yeah and so I do think that there is something like that very possible going on and then also just like the stress of her dad but it's also I think just the stress of not wanting to have to deal with whatever and especially because Annabeth knows that um like she knows that his prophecy says that he's supposed to be stabbed to death yeah and so there's always that part of it too of she knows that is supposed to happen to him so it's like do you really want to become really close to somebody that's gonna die one day yeah like everybody around her is either letting her down or something happens to them and like yeah she's had talia for like a year now or well a few months not even a whole year back mm -hmm. but even that it's not permanent she almost died like she doesn't know that percy is going to be a permanent fixture in her life that there's any stability there and so i think that's why when she's considering the hunters she's not factoring him it's more just I don't know how long this person's going to be in my life and everybody leaves or does their own thing eventually. So maybe I need to figure out what my own thing is. Mm -hmm. And it's like the irony that Percy is like the only person she could ever meet that will never do that to her. Mm -hmm. um, that would never leave her, but she doesn't, she doesn't quite like understand that completely yet. Um, yeah. He proves that to her with, honestly, with this whole situation, with how he comes after her and everything. But um, at that point, she would still almost be like questioning that because that's not what anybody else has ever done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't think I had any other mythology notes that I didn't get to yet. I mean, I I did mention that so far, like, the parentage and Zoe makes me question, because, like, I'm guessing Pleone may not be her actual mom. That's mm -hmm. my guess, is maybe that she's saying the term mother, but it's not actually her mother. It is always possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. I think we covered all of my notes. <sighs> They're really difficult. Um, so <laughs> I'm guessing based off of things you've said, we get into some heavier chapters next. Yeah. They're really difficult. Um, these are the ones that I've been like, like I, these are the ones that every time I think about them filming Titan's curse, I get like, actual anxiety about what it would be like for these actors to film these scenes mm -hmm. because it would be like somewhat traumatic to film them um just to act these things out and it's like this is part of the story they have to do it there's no way they're going to change this thing especially um mm -hmm. but it's so it's so awful um 
but it is like a big part of the story and so they're gonna have to do it but it's just i honestly feel like anxiety imagining all the different people that are involved having to act something like that out that's going to be really hard um yeah <laughs> I know yeah. that's the thing that people think about when they imagine Titan's Curse being adapted. Titan's Curse being adapted, everyone wants to see it because it's so many people's favorite books, like it is mine. But it's also a thing at the same time of being like, oh my god, like, all of these kids are going to have such a hard time this season acting all of this stuff out because it is very, like, emotionally challenging. Mm -hmm. Um especially for Walker playing Percy, he does not get like a break really ever in this book. There's never like a scene where Percy's feeling like good. Um, every scene is like hard when it comes to that. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, that will be literally no breaks. Like no. literally left his cabin not knowing he wasn't gonna come back to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. It's just from the very start, everything just keeps like getting worse and it just gets worse as it goes on. And so, and it ends with like not nice conversations about his fate and stuff. So it's not like an easy, it's never like an easy thing. It's just, that, that's why when Walker was talking about it, he was like, I hope there's some nice scenes with, with Thalia because it's like, oh my, there's hardly any, especially in this book, it's all very difficult um but it is part of the thing of playing a character like percy yeah. is i think it's i think it's interesting that a lot of people think about him like one of the things that a lot of fans have said since rick put out his little preview for the book that's coming out tomorrow is some people have been like oh it makes me sad to see that percy used to be like this happy-go-lucky kid and now in this like chapter he's more like you know, sad and doesn't want to do this stuff. And his friends are the ones that are excited, but he doesn't want to go and do this like quest thing that he has to do. And mm -hmm. it's just kind of like sad and just not excited about it. And they're like, he used to be excited about stuff. And I was like, I'm not sure that's actually accurate. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I'm like, I don't think he ever actually was. I think he just, did a good job of like deflecting with humor maybe when he, better when he was younger yeah. um but even when he was like a baby in the lightning thief i he never really struck me as somebody that was like excited to do this stuff um like dionysus has to literally like scream in his face mm -hmm. uh, to get him to go and he still says no and so like from the start he's not, just never really been someone that's like that but i think people have that idea because he's just a little kid in the beginning and his like humor that you read him say in his head that he doesn't necessarily share out loud or like he makes jokes out loud but you don't think if you don't think about the things he's actually thinking um it's not completely accurate <laughs> to what he's actually experiencing but it is something with him that the longer the books go on, the harder that stuff is. Because it's just more things have happened to him. Next week, we're doing chapters 13 and 14. 13 is We Visit the Junkyard of the Gods. Let's see, where's 14? 14 is I Have a Damn Problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta love that chapter name. 